And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the United States Copyright Office's World IP Day event in 2021, our second virtual um, World IP Day event. We're going to have a great program today. Um, and I, before we get started, I wanted to turn it over to the 14th Register of Copyrights, Shira Polmutter, to provide some opening remarks. Shira? Thank you, Katie. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome uh, to the US Copyright Office's celebration of World IP Day. Each year, we join the World Intellectual Property Organization and others all around the world to recognize the value that IP adds to our cultures and to society as a whole. This year, World IP Day focuses on small and medium-sized enterprises and their countless contributions to the creation and dissemination of intellectual property. This theme is particularly good, a particularly good fit uh, for copyright. Many creative businesses are small in size, yet produce immense value both economically and artistically. In fact, artists are over three times more likely than other workers to be self-employed. And in recent years, companies with fewer than 500 workers accounted for nearly half of all private sector payrolls. These small and medium-sized enterprises foster creativity far beyond their own walls in both the physical and the virtual space. A single photographer may take thousands of copyright protected images that shed light on subjects from current events to human relationships. Musicians too often work alone or with just a handful of colleagues composing and recording the songs that define eras and inspire us. Visual artists, filmmakers, writers, and app and game developers individually also light sparks of creativity that enrich our lives. Today, we will hear more about how some of these creators interact with copyright and contribute to society. I thank you for joining us today and I invite you to enjoy our discussions with Hakeem, Sunil, and Laura. So let me now turn it over to Whitney Lewandowski. Thank you so much, Register. Um, and I'd like to welcome our three panelists uh, up to the screen. Um, thank you so much to uh, Hakeem Draper, uh, Sunil Iyengar, and Laura Zabel for joining us today to talk about um, our World IP Day theme, Taking Your Business to Market. Um, before we begin, just to repeat a little bit of uh, housekeeping, um, we love questions. We'll have some time, about hopefully it's about 10 minutes at the end for questions. If you have one, please put it in the chat and then we can share it with the panelists. Um, and then if you are interested in closed captioning, uh, please see the option to view closed captioning in the bottom toolbar. Um, and note that this closed captioning is only available through the Zoom app. Okay, so thank you again for joining us today. Um, our theme, Taking Your Ideas to Market, is all about focusing on enterprising people who decide to take their creative talents and bring them to a wider public. These entrepreneurial efforts make a large impact on the individual creators' lives, on communities, and on the larger U.S. economy. Copyright provides a structure for artists to bring their creative expression to market, and many businesses spring from a creator's ability to publish, sell, share, display, and perform their work publicly. At the same time, other small and medium enterprises use the copyrightable works of others to build their businesses and continue the cycle of copyright. Um, we will be exploring the uh, nature of small and medium-sized businesses, uh, their experience over the past year, and um, how we can help support them. Um, so to get us started off, uh, Laura, hi. Um, thank you so much, Laura Zabel, Springboard for the Arts, for joining us today. Um, and I was wondering if you could start us off. Can you describe to us what a small or medium-sized creative business looks like? And how do these businesses benefit their communities? Yeah, thanks so much, Whitney. I'm super excited to be here. Um, happy World IP Day, everyone. <laughs> um, 
I think it's a really important question. It maybe sounds sort of simple, um, but I think it's important to kind of ground us in. For many creative businesses, these are businesses run by a single artist or, or a group of artists that have really grown out of their own artistic or creative practice. And I find that often when we talk about small and medium sized businesses for artists, there's a whole other part of the spectrum, which I think most people would call micro businesses or single person or one or two person businesses that are sometimes home based. Um, often kind of left out of the conversation around small business, uh, these micro enterprises. But to the second part of your question, I think even those very small single person businesses have these sort of bigger ripple impacts in their community that um, that are pretty unique to artistic businesses. You know, the, most creative businesses are not businesses that are built to kind of scale and be acquired by a global corporation. Success for them is often really tied to their local economy. So think about growing a lot of small businesses that are built to stay local and the impact that has on the economy and the community around them. I think additionally, businesses run by artists, creative businesses create um, the kinds of places that people want to live and work. They create experiences, whether that's in shopping or um, being able to attend performances or encounter um, art in your everyday, in, your, in the downtown of where you live, on the main street, in neighborhoods. Uh, and those are really the kinds of things that create the kind of fabric and places where people want to stay and commit to work. So they have these impacts on things like talent attraction and retention, on meaning making, on social connection, on public health, on community development, and they impact the other businesses around them, right? Like those are the kinds of businesses that draw people to a cultural district or to a business district. So I think even though we might look at an individual creative business and say that's very small or the kind of, you know, balance sheet at the end of the year isn't the same as attracting a, you know, corporation that employs 500 people, uh, they often have this really outsized impact on the community around around them that gets at both the economics, but also really fundamental human impacts, like the ways that we make meaning and build connection between communities and, and among neighbors that I think are, are really fundamental, um, particularly now after the last year, I think we've learned how fundamental those, those pieces of our community are. Thanks. And so, uh, Hakeem, um, Laura had talked about uh, the importance of sometimes small um, personal driven businesses uh, to local communities and how that these businesses are able to connect um, to important placemaking and um, venues and you know being able to make a, a sort of a community. Um, now your business in part of your expertise is to help clients understand how intellectual property rights and revenue flow together. For some of these micro or small entities, so maybe one or just a collective or a small collaboration of people, can you speak briefly about how it is important for them to understand copyright? Yeah, specifically, I, I work in the music phase. First, I want to just touch, Laura said something so important that the immeasurable impact of quality of life of arts overall in any general city is so important. Um, and I think it's it's often sort of undervalued a little bit, but I think it's one of the most important things. And so as I work with clients in the music space, recording studios and producers and artists, look, the, all of that is monetized by groups of people, but it all stems from one creative mind or a group of creative minds. And the ability for them to be able to thrive and, and build a business on that is about shared revenue. It's about fractional distribution and it's about, so it always involves understanding where your rights are, where does your revenue come from? How does the revenue move in the space? And then specifically from the music side, it's so important to understand what a copyright is. You know, I deal with a lot of novice people who are very excited to get into the space and you know, there's sampling and there's you know, interpolations where you take certain portions of a song and you use those lyrics in your song in an original way, but it's still an interpolation, it requires a license. So those interoperabilities and the importance of understanding how those layers work together to protect you in the end, 
I mean, in, in the beginning, it's very intimidating and confusing, but it, it's, it's necessary. And it, so it's imperative to survival for any creator um, to understand the value of, of copyrights and how they're all tied together and how they do work to protect what original piece you are creating. And so you mentioned intimidating, um, which I think is sometimes a common, a common feeling, especially for people that are just getting started out in the business. Would you have uh, a, like a lesson or um, something to share for people who are just starting uh, in their businesses? Yeah, I mean, I think that don't listen to so many people, but like there are some definitive resources, your site, for instance, that has very clear information as to what these copyrights are and how you submit and apply for your own for your works and all of those things i think you have to find some some people that you trust that can kind of mentor you and again like laura's organization does that where when you get into the weeds and you need to figure out how to take your okay i finished my masterpiece now what do i do and you're like you don't run out and take it to market first we protect it, we register it, we, we figure out all of the ways we're going to monetize it, we figure out, you know, so I think for anybody doing this stuff, you have to kind of just find some trusted resources. There's a lot of nonprofits out there. There is, the, again, your site is a great resource and you have to just kind of learn for yourself. And, and I tell everybody, I don't, expect any of them to become an expert on copyrights but i i expect them if you're building a business in the creative space to know where their money's going to come from and how it moves and how much they're obligated to pay to other people that are involved uh, i think it's very important to successfully you know existing in this space and i think that the definition of success once you get beyond that is i know people who have been in bands and making music for 30 years. They, they make a very comfortable living and nobody's ever heard of them. And, and they, they tour once a year because they have a diehard fan base all over the world. And, and, and they're so content and they're so happy. And, and to them, they are the most successful band in the world. <laughs> and it's awesome. It's great to be able to see that, you know? Thank you. And then uh, Hakeem did mention um, the services uh, that Laura's organization provides. Laura, would you want to just spend a, a couple seconds uh, telling us what Springboard for the Arts is all about? Sure. Um, so Springboard is uh, based here in Minnesota, both in the urban area of the Twin Cities and in a rural community called Fergus Falls. Uh, but we also provide resources and services um, across the whole country. And our focus is really on individual artists, artists of all disciplines, and um, the ways in which artists are able to make a living and a life, and the ways that artists are able to impact their communities and be involved um, across all parts of the things that communities need to be healthy. Um, specific to this conversation around IP and kind of business skills and business building, um, I'll just put in a plug. We have a free uh, online um, workbook called The Work of Art, Business Skills for Artists. It's a free download or you can order a hard copy. Um, and that kind of goes through all the basic business building things. It's really meant um, for people to be able to use, you know, whatever pieces of it they're working on at the moment around their creative business. And there are some resources in there specific to IP and other legal issues. Um, Springboard also uh, is part of a national network of organizations all across the country that do that engage um, lawyers and, and attorneys uh, to support artists, part of a volunteer lawyers for the arts network. So we do that work in Minnesota, um, but we're also connected to organizations all across the country that do um, that work to connect uh, individual artists with questions around their business, um, you know, the vast majority of those questions are around IP uh, with local attorneys who specialize in that work because often the answer, you know, to, to Hakeem's point, like the first place to start is with other artists in your network, mentors, folks who have done it before, Springboard's an organization run by artists and that's the perspective we come at it from. Um, and often the second step is gonna be that you need to talk to a local um, attorney, somebody who really understands uh, the, the issues in the context that you're working in um, and who can really give you some, some clear legal advice to make sure that you're protecting yourself um, in, in the way that you need to. Great, thank you.
And Sunil, so we've, we've spent some time establishing the personal and the local. I wonder if you could bring, get, bring us some big picture. Um, what does the creative economy mean to the United States? Yeah, well, um, just to, first of all, it's just great to be here with you and to be uh, Whitney and be alongside uh, Hakeem and Laura, great colleagues. Um, I just wanted to just note that, um, you know, the National Endowment for the Arts, many of you, some of you may not know, is that, you know, is a fe independent federal agency that supports the arts all across the United States. Um, but we do have a research function. So in that capacity, a few years ago, we got together with uh, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, the Department of Commerce and said, can we do anything to measure the cumulative value of this creative economy in the US? And you know, if you look around, like there is no national definition really of the creative economy that's been operationalized. Um, thankfully your office and other offices, I could mention the Patent Trademark Office and, may, and, and now the National Endowment for the Arts, I think are flashpoints for discussing in the federal government where what is the creative economy and how do we measure it? Um, thankfully, with our partners at the Bureau of Economic Analysis, we were able to establish, create a tool really called the Arts and Production, Arts and Cultural Production Satellite Account. It sounds very grand, but uh, what it is essentially is it's a way to track the economic value of the arts industries and to do that in totality and also to be able to get the level of granularity that allows you to understand what specific elements or subsectors contribute to the economy and how many people they employ, for example. So getting back to your question with the, you know, what is the creative economy here? If just to let you know, I mean, these arts industries as a whole um, make up about half of all the economic value generated by copyright intensive industries in the US. Um, the World uh, Intellectual Property Organization de defines copyright intensive industries and that's one proxy or way to understand how, how significant the arts are when it comes up against all kinds of other copyright intensive industries. We don't contain all of it within the arts, but a good deal. Um, so what does this amount to? We're talking about uh, $919 billion of added value to GDP. That's about 4.3% of total GDP. Um, and um, you know, within that, we can talk about what industries make that up. Of course, you're gonna see you know, motion pictures, uh, you know, recording, the sound recording industry, publishing, uh, performing arts presenters, um, various industries, including architecture, design, a whole range of them. And it's sort of very expansive view of what the arts economy truly is. Um, but some other tidbits there, you know, if you wanna know what is that 909, uh, million, a billion dollars, what is that total close to a trillion there? Uh, well, it's actually larger in terms of value added than you find from uh, proportionally from various other sectors in the U.S. Um, you know, it's larger than the amount contributed to the economy by, say, agriculture, by transportation, uh, by tourism, a whole bunch of other industries, mining, extraction, a whole bunch of industries. And so, you know, there definitely does, I think we have the value there of, of elevating why arts and culture is core to the creative enterprise in the U.S. through dollars alone, but we could also talk about it in numerous other ways, of course, and I hope we will. Thank you. And so you mentioned, you know, some of those subsectors that you talked about: um, motion pictures, performing arts, publishing. Um, these are all, you know, recall to each of our minds wonderful, you know, pieces of creativity that we've all appreciated and loved. And I think that there's also no question um, that when we hear those terms or those industries, we also think about the impact and what people have experienced over the past year. Um, it's been a year of you know, upheaval, uncertainty, and great change um, for everyone in the creative community. And um, so I'd like to spend some time considering the challenges and opportunities that everyone has faced. Um, so uh, Sunil, if I could just stay with you for, for a moment, um, how do we measure or notice the impact of the pandemic on creative communities? Well, actually back in January, um, we released a little white paper that we did actually through our partners at FEMA. Um, because this is an emergency to the economy too. When, when uh, you know the pandemic, the ravages of the pandemic, of course, hit artists and arts organizations among the hardest. Um, you know, I know this is about small businesses, so I'll just say there's a data source called the Small Business Pulse uh, Survey, which the Census Bureau got out as soon as the pandemic occurred. Where on a weekly basis they were tracking how small businesses were doing of various industry types, and we saw over and over again, arts industries were hit the hardest. Uh, among the hardest and certainly up there with ho the hospitality industry, for example. 
Um, so that was a really useful metric to understand at least the small businesses in the arts, how they were faring. But beyond that, um, you know, so with FEMA, we put out this white paper and it, it tracked you know, a lot of other data sources that we helped to provide, including uh, revenues of performing arts industries. Uh, I think performing arts organizations, nonprofits in particular, uh, looking at how they fared. Um, understanding employment. I think what, was, what Shira said is so true that artists are in fact entrepreneurs at heart because I mean they are highly likely to be self-employed or to be doing multiple jobs and so when the gig economy as a whole was threatened by the pandemic uh, and I know we're not talking yet about sort of the health and well-being consequences of that that Hakeem was alluding to but that's so central to this question as well but just in terms of economics um, you know understanding the unemployment rates and how for example uh, dancers uh, musicians actors had much, much higher unemployment rates than other workers even, and, and that was going till the, I think as late as the end of last year. I think things are recovering a little bit, like you're starting to see the unemployment rates get a little lower even for those groups. Um, but you know, so many of them are self-employed and I think that's what's made it also hard to really measure in the way we would like to because there's limited information about some of these artists and arts workers. Um, but what we do know, you know, those are some indicators I would offer. And you know, a lot of that I've spoken about so far is about the performing arts sector. And that's kind of intentional because certainly the arts sector was hit all across, you know, museums, galleries, every other sector, subsector, but no question that performing arts industries seem to have you know, been hit the most. Um, and you know, this, this is you know, this variety of reasons we know about, you know, stay at home orders, shutterings, et cetera. Um, but you know that also had a ripple effect as was alluded to, to um, the local economies in which they're, you know, which they inhabit. And so that has to be taken into account, you know, people's likelihood to go out and experience other activities because they just came out of a performing arts event, you know, will I go to lunch down the street? Will I, you know, what other kinds of activities will I do in my neighborhood? Um, that's, that's had a ripple effect and that's been harder to measure. Thank you. And uh, Hakeem, would you mind speaking a little bit to that? Um, can you highlight the business, like kind of the biggest way that musicians have been affected during the pandemic? Yeah, I think specifically in emerging artists and music, you know, it's been devastating because they they are dependent on live performance. They are dependent on connecting with new fans and and you know moving the needle on their promotion. And they don't have the ad dollars to compensate. Um, so there's no other outlet. I mean, they, you know, a lot of people have tried some live streaming stuff. And if you if you already had a decent fan base, you know, we've had some artists that were able to convert that um, into an app ecosystem with, you know, pay-per-view and all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, but if you weren't already established, if you didn't already do a couple of tours, I think right now you're, you're still sitting and you're going, what am I going to do? We've, we've lost historic venues that to most people was just that dive bar around the corner. Uh, but it was a staple stop for artists on the way. You had to, you know, you had to be able to pack that little 400 seat room and, in the middle of nowhere. And that room's gone. Um, and, and so is all that history. And so I think that the challenges are still revealing themselves on how artists are going to adapt um, you know, I think getting out and being able to play outdoors and some of the stuff that's been going on, has been fine, but the money's not there. It's not the same revenue. Um, in, in the early days for emerging artists, you, you depend on every penny you can get out of every opportunity. Um, and I think that hasn't come back yet. And I think there's a lot of people that are, you know, really kind of terrified as to, when, when is that, how is that going to come back? When is it going to come back? Um, and, you know, I think that as a response, I think that a lot of artists that I work with or that we are connected with have gotten more creative um, outside of just creating music. They've, they've gotten with their collective teams and said, well, what else do we do? Let's do other stuff podcasts and YouTube channels and, you know, building, just having to slow build momentum wherever they can. And I think that's, I mean, for, for me, I tell every artist that we talk to is that you have to look uniquely into your ecosystem and go, okay, what, what other creative outlets can you come up with that, you know, aren't, aren't just you performing your song over and over in front of an Instagram live, which is not very entertaining. 
Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the challenge for everybody right now. So you, you have to get out of your comfort zone. You have to put yourself out there in different ways. And touring is just putting yourself out there. So it's finding new and creative ways to put yourself out there and connect with people. Thanks. And thanks for targeting that, um, you know, having to sort of uniquely look into your own ecosystem and then um, pushing out of the usual comfort zone. And so Laura, pushing, having creative people push themselves out of their usual comfort zone to get their products to market, has that changed the nature of the questions that you've been seeing or the support that's been sought by members of the community? Um, and could you give us a couple of examples? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just echoing what Sunil and, and Hakeem have highlighted, I think the, you know, um, environment for artists in the last year is something that, uh, you know, people never could have anticipated the sort of catastrophic nature and the way that it has touched pretty much all artists at all stages of their career in, in some ways. Um, I mean, you think about certainly performing artists, uh, and I think that's um, easy for a lot of people to imagine, but it also, you know, you think about visual artists or craft artists who make the majority of their living selling work directly at fairs in the summer or at festivals. Um, and you think about the number of artists who teach in schools or work in elder care facilities or who have second jobs, you know, in the hospitality industry. Uh, and it just sort of at all at all levels um, had had a really big impact. And and like others have said, I think it only took a few minutes for artists to put their creativity to that moment and to really think about how to work within those constraints, you know, what was possible and also what their communities needed over the last year, which has been tremendous in terms of our need for ongoing social connection and, and meaning making and processing of grief and, um, and the, uh, you know, sort of doubling of the crisis with the uprising and reckoning around racial justice. Um, so yeah, that's changed pretty much all the questions. Um, I think, you know, I'm sure a lot of folks uh, listening can can imagine that there's been a huge push for folks to move their work online um, across all disciplines. And, and of course, some artistic disciplines are more inclined towards that um, than, than others. And some things work better online than others, but it also opens up a whole set of new IP questions for folks where, you know, there, there was one set of questions when you were doing this live and in person, but now if, if that performance is online or images of your work are online in a different way and can be taken and used, um, I think that's a whole new a whole new set of questions. We've also seen a lot of artists really leaning into their creativity around more analog ways of showing um, their work or getting their work out there. We supported about 80 projects across the state of Minnesota that were projects specifically designed to address issues of social isolation. And I was really moved by how many of those projects weren't um, kind of internet based projects. You know, they were people making zines that were mailed from person to person and really creating these tangible experiences. I think in a moment where people want to be able to touch and hold something that that brings them together or builds a connection even across the distance. Um, and then maybe the last thing I'll mention in terms of specific issues um, that I think really highlights how the context changes intellectual property questions. You know, I'm um, talking to you today from Minneapolis and We've been at the center of um, a lot that's happened over the last year and a lot of crisis and a lot of pain and trauma in our community. And one of the most hopeful and beautiful things I think that has happened is the number of artists who have stepped to the moment, you know, painting boards and murals on businesses that are boarded up or who have been damaged, um, you know, really uh, participating as leaders in movement work around social change. And there are IP questions even there. So for example, last summer in the uprising after George Floyd's murder, there was an explosion of murals all across the city, mostly on boards on small businesses. Um, and then, you know, a few weeks later, there was a huge push towards someone should collect these to document this moment in history. And it brings up a lot of questions about who owns that, the artist who painted it, the person who bought the plywood, the business who has the board on it. And I don't think any of that conversation was really driven by like, 
who has the ability to monetize this work, but whose work, whose story is that to claim? Um, who gets to keep that work? Who gets to tell that story in the long term? I think it's um, those are really thorny questions that I think illuminate how important IP is, even outside of the ways that it's connected to how people make a living or monetize their work. But it has real impacts on our ability to tell a community narrative or for a community to own its own narrative um, sometimes too, and, and artists' participation in that. Thank you. And Sunil, I know you had uh, unmuted yourself. Did you have some follow-up thoughts? Well, I just thought it's interesting. I mean, we did this report um, uh, again, released again earlier this year called the, the Art of Reopening, where we tried to understand what business practices organizations were using who were in fact re-engaging with live audiences, in-person audiences in their facilities during the pandemic. Because if you recall, Last summer, you know, there was some reopening here and there, and then it kind of shut down again. We wanted to know what they had learned from that experience. And a lot of what Laura is saying rings true about the issues around copyright. Um, we didn't treat that very much in the report. Um, but there is there's this, you know, maybe it's kind of a paradox in that, you know, even though a lot of arts organizations right now have been pushed to do more virtual engagement, uh, and on the one hand, that's opened up a lot of opportunities to get you know, if you will, global market share, right? They can get outside their own communities and get other people from all around, people they wouldn't come into the door of their facilities potentially. So that's, that seems kind of, loop, you know, possible, that's, that holds out uh, promise, but it's, it's not, it can be deceptively simple to think that that's going to be a panacea clearly. And there's a lot of issues in terms of the fixed costs that, and, you know, really higher costs that, that are incurred to make that happen. And a lot of these arts organizations aren't necessarily set up to be, to kind of to have a hybrid kind of model in the future where a lot of their work is online and a lot of their stuff is in person. So it's a question of how much they can sustain that kind of um, you know, online engagement and uh, also monetize it as was said. But the, the sort of maybe mini paradox here is that even as people are maybe having more outreach in terms of virtual, uh, they've really doubled down in many ways on what they do in their local communities in the way that was described because you know, part of it's a function of people not being able to, you know, you, you can't attract tourists as much anymore, for example. So let's focus on our community members. But that's also made many arts leaders, uh, I don't want to use the word accountable, but more responsive maybe to what the needs are of their communities and understanding these issues of equity and inclusion at a much deeper level because they now, you know, people who may, communities where these arts organizations may have been, may not have been accustomed to engaging with those organizations. And now this is kind of forced, you know, a lot of these arts organizations to work more actively in their local communities to, to build audiences long-term and patrons and partners. Um, so there's this kind of two pronged kind of thing going on with virtual engagement on the one hand, where it's not so much about local audiences and the much more uh, specific community level kind of engagement. And I think both are necessary now. Thank you. And then Hakeem, did you have any uh, final thoughts for us? Uh, well, I was actually, when when Laura brought up the the pieces that were done on the, the you know, plywood, it, it just, it, it goes back to the importance of understanding these copyright laws. I'm, um, we, we deal with some issues in the same space for tattoo artists. Who owns the tattoo, the copyright to the tattoo? The, the guy whose body it's on or the guy who who actually created the the, the design and then put it on um, is it a work for hire is he buying a copyright right um, so we've we've been in start to look at like when you start to think about these murals It looks like Hakeem, we've got a little bit of a hit. Outreach of what we do, where we spend so much time going into, you know, communities where, frankly, they're they're not even coming to your website because that's the last thing on their mind. And and you know, going to where these creators are, you know, developing um, and having these conversations and being able to get ahead of it because a very interesting thing happened. Um, over the summer, I had an artist who I was working with, 
and he wanted he had a buddy whose window was smashed up on his business and he wanted to go do a nice big piece on there and i said you should buy the plywood you should tell him what you want to do and you should buy the plywood so when he's ready to take it down you can take it home and just be up front about that um, and then the guy wound up buying it from him when he reopened the store to incorporate it into the new design and all this so but like it, I, I know it's impossible to even think about things like that when you're in the moment and when you're when you're really in the creative space. And I'm, I'm I started as a music producer and and you know engineer and songwriter. So when you're in the space of creation, it's it's virtually impossible to step outside of it. But I think that in your process overall, everyone needs to find a moment to step outside of it and go, okay, what am I not thinking of? To Laura's point. You know, I, I don't let any artist do anything without seeking out some kind of entertainment attorney and getting their, their advice. M most entertainment attorneys that are worth their salt will talk to you for free if you've got something real going on just to earn your business. So, you know, and, and even if it's a few hundred dollars, I mean, what's your future worth to you? What if it's the, the biggest, best thing you've ever done and it, it goes viral and takes off and generates hundreds of millions of dollars? Uh, it's worth it. It's a worthwhile investment. So I just think it's fascinating. I think it's, it's, it's complex and, you know, more outreach, more on the ground and more looking at interesting scenarios like this, where that is almost impossible to answer right now. Some, they hired some company to do the board up. They didn't even buy the wood. So the company comes with the wood for the board up. And now this guy puts a, puts a nice mural on it, does the business who hired the company who then paid for the wood own it? Does the guy who did the mural own it? Does the company in the middle own it? Who owns that copyright? I think it's actually more complex than we even recognize right now if we really got into the weeds on it. So I think figuring out ways to build in to early development for artists, some aspect of consideration to these things in their process is imperative to success in creators and creatives. Thank you, Hakeem. Um, so we, I feel like we have spent a lot of time um, really exploring and unfolding how enmeshed um, we are all with um, you know, small businesses and creatives and um, you know, people in the larger community and uh, connections between um, how uh, the two kind of work together and exist together. Um, and I just would like to round out the last few minutes of our conversation um, talking about just kind of celebrating the importance of these businesses um, and highlighting uh, some support that is available to them as well as, you know, just maybe discussing how we support them, right? So how do, how do we make sure that this ecosystem, no matter what happens, comes next, right? Because it feels like we're at an inflection point. Um, no matter what comes next, how do we make sure that these small and, and medium businesses um, thrive. And um, so I think, I guess maybe, um, Sunil, can I just touch base with you really briefly, because I think that we've gotten to the how art works model um, in our discussion naturally. I think that we've talked a lot about this ecosystem, um, but could you briefly just codify it for us and how the NEA has sort of formed a, a, a way of visualizing? Sure. Well, we have a report. This is now, I guess, close to 10 years old, but it's it's kind of had successive uh, work on it. Um, and it's guided our research agenda, among other things, um, which is a way we sort of visualized a kind of theory of change about the arts or systems map. And that seems really baffling. Like, what is that for the arts? I mean, it's so diverse and heterogeneous. But, you know, if you, you look at creativity at the core of the arts, and if you can imagine concentric circles, and I can share this uh, through the, I've been bombarding your audience members with stuff through the chat uh, resources, but we can send that report. And it's kind of like a diagram, but then kind of, it's like, you know, it kind of describes like the core is creative, you know, creative industries and creative workers and how it expands to broader participants in that community, that ecosystem, and uh, sort of what the inputs are and what the sort of outcomes are associated with that, with that, um, that the central node, if you will. And it sort of, it allows you to see the relationships of these different actors in this ecosystem in a way that may allow you to think about very deliberately if you're an organization or a policymaking organization, particularly how you support various aspects of that ecosystem. Um, so, you know, I, I guess one of the things I just want to point out that 
um, we are actually in the process and we hope in maybe in a couple of months to release a report about um, artists who use technology as a creative medium, because that's a segment, if you will, of this ecosystem that we have not really done a terrific job of tracking, I think, in the cultural, among cultural funders. Um, you know, knowing about, uh, you know, all the ways in which, um, you know, we already know how arts organizations, many of them use technology for their backroom operations, for administrative purposes, even for distributing their creative work. But how do you use, how are people using technology to make art? And um, we, we did a series of round table meetings and sort of town hall meetings, if you will, over the last year or two, and even you know, pre-pandemic, and then followed that up with you know, other work, literature reviews, et cetera. And this report is probably gonna come out in a, in a couple of months, um, but it's also been supported by the Ford Foundation and the Knight Foundation who are very interested in this question. So it comes up with, it includes recommendations for uh, how we can try to support this class of workers better. And uh, and the, the sort of and, and really elevate them as part of this whole arts ecosystem because a lot of times you know high artists are the are sort of chimeric hybrid figures they have all these kinds of you know they're sometimes in multiple sectors we talked about how they're likely to be self-employed but we lose sight sometimes of those who are dependent on technology in the creation process and that raises its whole whole set of other issues around copyright as well as. Um, training and resources needed for that, those kinds of artists. So we'll be releasing that report in uh, coming months. So I just wanted to flag that. Thank you very much. Um, and so, Laura, we had a little bit of discussion about the ecosystem and recognizing um, their own place. Um, you know, Springboard, part of their mission is that they are for artists and by artists. Um, how can artists and creators help each other succeed? Yeah, I think so. Uh, like you said, Springboard's an organization run by and for artists. Everyone on our 17 person staff is a practicing artist themselves. And that value of, um, you know, helping within our own community and building the ecosystem for artists within our own community is really important to us. I think one of the challenges for individual artists um, that's really been illuminated over the last year that certainly existed before but I think a lot more people understand it now is that the ecosystem for individual artists such that it exists is really localized and there isn't really a national system for individual artists it is a matter of each artist in your own place sort of cobbling together other artists that you trust Maybe there are small business organizations in your community that understand the needs of creative businesses and you can work with them. Maybe it's a local community developer. It might be your public library. It might be resources you download online. Um, it might be relationships you have in your own neighborhood or in your own community. And there, you know, we saw that um, especially a year ago when, uh, you know, the kind of system for emergency relief for artists who were really falling through the gaps, especially at the beginning of other relief efforts, depended initially on what became a network of hundreds of small local groups of artists and arts organizations running their own emergency relief funds. Um, and that's work that we were able to help support in a lot of different ways, but just by sharing what we've done here in Minnesota and, and um, kind of sharing the tools and the process for that. So I think in terms of what artists need, there, there are very clear policy changes that need to happen to close some of those gaps. And I'm, if I have optimism right now, it's that I think a lot more people recognize what those system gaps are. And then the same system gaps that exist for a lot of other small businesses and other gig workers and self-employed folks around healthcare, around access to unemployment, around other kinds of safety nets, um, and around the kinds of legal and contract protections that need to exist that make it so that, you know, a year ago when the bottom fell out and things were getting canceled, we saw organizations, venues, sometimes trying to claw back commissions and payments that they had already made to artists who had signed contracts that didn't protect them from, from that, uh, that didn't require those commissioners to provide any kind of support or any kind of runway or any kind of safety net when they canceled the contracts. So there's a lot that needs to change in the ecosystem and a lot that needs to be built out. I think there are also some, like I said, some reasons for optimism. I think a whole heck of a lot more people recognize those gaps than they did a year ago. Um, and I think there's a sort of spirit right now of 
um, openness to some better experimentation of how we support creative workers and, and small businesses. Um, here in St. Paul in Minnesota, we just launched a new guaranteed income pilot in partnership with the city of St. Paul and the National Network of Mayors for Guaranteed Income that will focus on artists and creative workers in our neighborhood in St. Paul. And, and that pilot is really meant to be on a research opportunity for us to better document and, um, and demonstrate the impact of supporting creativity in a neighborhood and, and the ways that that impacts the rest of the community and the rest of the economy in the hopes that artists can be more at that table around the kind of economic system changes that need to happen uh, for the benefit of a lot of people, um, not just artists for sure, but I think artists should, should be a part of those bigger system-wide conversations and policy change conversations that I think are emergent right now and, and really ripe for um, for making that change maybe more quickly than we could have uh, had had the last year not happened. Absolutely, thank you so much. And um, one of the things that you had mentioned um, was the, the challenges and opportunities of uh, long-term contracts um, and thinking about contracts. And uh, Heem, what would you think is the biggest copyright issue that um, creators should think about when they're signing a contract? Ooh, when you're signing the contract, um, I tell artists all the time that I, I don't believe in the bad deal. I believe there are bad offers and there are bad decisions. Um, so, uh, you know, look, what it just, you have to think these things through. You have to uh, assume this is your shot to create your next opportunity and that's it. Um, and you really have to think them through. And I think that before signing any contract, I really do that like getting proper legal advice from someone who can really represent your interest. I think the, the other side of this in, in this space, especially in the early stage, the emerging stage is a lot of people will offer you up a lot of advice and you have to look at sort of where they're just, where they're a stakeholder. Uh, what is their interest in, and, you know, is their interest in getting your content for their platform or their deal or their company, or is their interest looking out for your best interest and the best interest of your IP? Um, and so I think just, you know, being a, you know, a lawyer is the key thing. Don't sign anything without getting proper legal advice from somebody who understands the space, not, not your uncle who does DUI cases, somebody who understands copyright IP and, and the space that you're operating in. Um, it's, it's imperative. Uh, it's, it's really the only way. It's the only way to potentially you know, protect yourself. I think one other interesting thing, um, I'm part of an ongoing debate that we've been having on whether AI generated music or art of any kind, copyright can be owned at all. Um, and, and I don't know that anyone has an answer for that. Uh, but it's something when you look at the sort of future and technology, especially te you know creators using technology, um, if, if you're a programmer and you create an AI program that then generates music, well, that AI program, if it's true AI, is it's independent of you. you, you you've, you've just set it free and now it, it does its own thing and creates. So can a computer own a copyright? Who gets to own that copyright? I think that this, this space is so fascinating to me and I, I love it. Um, but I think that we have to be more forward thinking about, I mean, not just right now where we are with technology, but look at how fast things are moving in, in this space with, especially with creation. I mean, if you, even, even when you look at everybody utilizing predetermined loop packages, when you start using enough of that content, there's no clear copyright at all, ever. And, and, you know, so I think people just have to really be forward thinking about this stuff and, and look, not just where we are, but where we're headed, where we're now starting to have a lot of machine learning engines and a lot of things that help that assist us in creation. Um, and I think that, you know, there's a, there's a, a really fine line that creators need to 
understand that, you know, the, the work has to be created by them in order for them to be able to own it. Um, and, you know, if not, there's arguments that can be made. And those arguments, they, they might not be won or lost. They could just tie your stuff up forever. Well, thank you. And I, I really appreciate that um, each of you have uh, sort of wrapped this up with a, a future looking and taken a look at the challenges and sort of the opportunities that are coming in policymaking, in community building, uh, and in technology. Um, so I'm going to pause just for a second so that we could um, have uh, our guest from the U.S. Uh, Patent and Trademark Office, Miriam Deschamps. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Miriam. Um, she's here to tell us about other World IP Day celebrations. Thank you so much, Whitney. It's good to see you and it's good to see all my fellow panelists as well. Thank you for letting me tag in. Um, so my name is Miriam Deshaun. I direct our Global IP Academy at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, or USPTO, um, which is a, a Department of Commerce uh, agency that's uh, America's innovation agency uh, developing and promoting reliable, predictable, and high-quality intellectual property systems here and abroad with our colleagues at the Copyright Office. Um, so I think Holland's going to put up some slides for me, and then I'll just uh, go through them for a couple minutes and pass it back to all of you. Thanks so much. Um, so like I mentioned, um, of course, the US Patent and Trademark Office uh, also has resources for small businesses. And we thought it would be an excellent idea um, to both participate in the Copyright Office's uh, public event on World IP Day, and also to invite the Copyright Office to uh, collaborate with us on our event, which will be later today at 3. Uh, so with that, um, next slide, please. I'll just tell you a little bit more about us and how we can help. Um, we'll skip this one. Next slide. Uh, just, I'm sure you went over this, but I just want to highlight, just as you wrap up the program, there are four main types of intellectual property in the United States, although, of course, you'll hear about different types as well. Um, patents, which protect new and inventive ideas, trademarks, which identify the origin of goods or services, and, of course, copyrights, uh, as well as trademarks, which is any information valuable and kept confidential. Um, so, next slide, please. The USPTO is, uh, has resources to help you with the first two. Next slide. And those are the ones I'll be going through just right now. So first, uh, when filing an application for a patent uh, to protect an idea uh, that has utility or a trademark to protect the brand that you own, um, the first line of defense is the USPTO Assistance Centers. These are available all day, every day, weekdays, um, and in, by our website as well, uspto.gov. Next slide. Uh, I also make, I want to make you aware of our micro entity status designation. I just want to highlight this right, right now, because uh, it does provide a 75% discount on most patent fees. And additionally, it's important to know about an option to have a low cost submission to establish your filing date, which is the provisional patent application, which uh, depending on your entity size um, can be discounted even further. Uh, when you're a micro entity, you're basically a small business under 500 employees, just like the SBA says, and you haven't been named as an inventor on more than four previously filed path applications. So this is a designation that might be really helpful for any of you if you have works that um, have a utility to them that puts them outside of copyright uh, protection. Next slide. So if you want to file a patent application on your own, just go back one. Thanks. Uh, you should just be aware that, of course, this process is complex. So just like Akeem was saying, it's always good to engage with an attorney who can give you the best legal advice, which the government cannot give you. Um, but if that's out of your um, you know, cost uh, payment abilities, just be aware, um, next slide please, that there are options to support you that the USPTO has and that the USPTO engages with uh, outside. So when you're filing pro se or by yourself, uh, you can have support that's going to give you some uh, education and outreach, some guidance, one-on-one uh, -on -one assistance, uh, but again, not taking the place of an IP attorney. Next, uh, assistance with trademark application processes. We're proud that we've recently redone this trademark basics page, which I really direct especially all of you to since you will probably want to protect the brand that you're carrying as well as all of the copyrightable content. Um, it'll take you through application, exam, publication, registration, 
all of the essentials that direct you to educational programming that we have going on for free at a regular basis. Uh, and just so you know, not everyone is required to have an attorney when filing before the PTO for trademark, but consider whether or not you should for the same reasons addressed earlier in the panel. Uh, next. This is the homepage, this is the hub. This is the inventors and entrepreneurs hub. It's recently been redone. Check it out. It's just uspto.gov slash inventors. It's gonna get you started, help you understand how to apply, what resources are available, all the ones I'm talking about today, and help you after you apply through the process, which is somewhat more extensive um, than in, in some ways than filing for copyright in terms of follow-up, uh, maintenance, and then uh, protecting yourself against some uh, fraud issues. You'll also learn about some startup resources once, uh, if you have a business and you're in sort of the mid stage of your business and you're looking into various funding, um, ways to uh, ways to leverage your intellectual property um, that, uh, that require larger business plans and thinking about your strategy. Next page. Thanks. So this is, this is the second most important page at pto.gov, which is find help in your area. Uh, USPTO has a number of regional offices covering regions, as well as a lot of headquarters resources that will cover uh, virtually or uh, by the phone. Uh, areas including uh, patent and trademark resource centers in your area that are in public libraries, um, patent pro bono programs that can help connect you with a registered uh, attorney who can represent you before the PTO uh, free of charge, and then um, a, a large number of um, legal clinics within universities that uh, assign students under the guidance of faculty to represent you before PTO. Um, so if you go to the site, you can click on the state that you live in, and um, it'll just take you to your regional office and all the resources that are right there. But just don't forget that plenty of, of these resources and educational programs are available at a national level, uh, and you can see those anytime. Uh, so next slide, just go ahead to events, and I'll just say uh, next slide that today at three, um, we'll be hosting uh, the Copyright Office, Katie Rowland, along with uh, Mary Kutheritz, our uh, Chief Policy Officer on a panel about USPTO and Copyright Office resources for small businesses. Uh, and before that, we will be hearing from uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization, as well as the head of PTO and small businesses themselves as they you know, make it through this whole process. So uh, thanks very much for that opportunity. I'll just encourage you to reach out to any of your US government representatives if you have questions about intellectual property and the way that the US system works. Um, I think we're all proud of it and we, we want to be accessible uh, to you in all of your creative and innovative work. So thanks so much, Wendy. Thanks, Miriam. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, so we have two precious minutes left and with all of the uh, opportunities that were brought up in this, this moment of change, um, for creative community. I just would like to get your final thoughts um, about what can creative business owners do to influence this change and participate in this change? I'll jump in. <laughs> you just said it. You have to participate if you're going to influence the change. If, you know, from the, the moment the Music Modernization Act passed, we've been very proactive in trying to be participating in it from a community standpoint and trying to make sure that people can understand the different changes that are going to come as far as that goes and now to the mlc and making sure that outreach is is getting beyond the traditional outlets because again you have to get into the communities where this stuff is really starting and where you know the, by the time kids are discovered specifically in the music space like right? by the time you're quote unquote discovered you have probably a bunch of tracks out you you've started to get hundreds of thousands of plays and you you don't have a bmi or ASCAP, and you have no idea about the mlc um and so you know just people have to be proactive they have to participate um you know when if you're going to influence this in any way, you have to be able to provide informed feedback on what things you need changed or what needs to be made easier for you or people like you. And I think you don't get to do that unless you participate actively in the whole process. Thank you, Hakeem. 
Um, I guess I would offer uh, from the National Endowment for the Arts, you know, we, um, we have a lot to do and we're hopeful to, um, you know, kind of expand the number of people and organizations can participate not only in the creative enterprise nationwide, but can really uh, reap the benefits of that through uh, and, and really make sure there's more equitable participation, if you will, in the creative economy or the arts part of it um, through our grant making. So, um, you know, through the historic uh, legislation that was to offer COVID relief, um, we, you know, we're fortunate to get about $135 million that we're going to be rapidly turning around into grants uh, for those arts organizations that have been hit the hardest by the pandemic, um, but also to support the artists and arts workers that, that come in to do that work. Um, so that's where our kind of mission is kind of where we're really focused right now in the short term and in doing so in a very equitable way. And that's partly in response to uh, the president's challenge to, to the government through uh, a couple of ex executive orders he's put out uh, particularly around equ equity and um, underserved populations. So, you know, it's extending the benefits of the creative economy and full bringing people into the workforce for that economy through, for example, arts education, that I think uh, we can do our best to, um, to ensure that the benefits are distributed. Thank you, Sunil. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, the last year has demonstrated the many, many ways that our systems and our economy don't work for a lot of people, um, not, not only artists. And so for me, part of the what's needed or how artists can help in this moment, <clears throat> excuse me, is to figure out locally, especially how we work in solidarity with other folks who are working on those gaps. I think this is the, the things that impact artists in this moment around our economy, around equity, um, around intellectual property, they're not, they're not necessarily unique to artists and we're not gonna solve them on our own. We need to be um, in the work with other folks who are also helping to imagine new ways that our economy can actually work for more people at a local level, um, particularly I think around this question of, the gig economy and um, folks who are often working without a safety net whose labor is undervalued and um, who are often exploited and, and extracted from. And that's that's artists and creators, but it's also a lot of other people too um, who are working in that economy. And so I think there is a moment and an opportunity for us to be in partnership with those other movements, with other people who are really trying to figure out how to rebuild something that works better, not just go back to normal and what we had before and see that as the goal, but to really see this as an opportunity to make real change. And that's not gonna happen overnight. We have to work in the systems that we have while we work to dismantle those systems and build something new. Um, but I think it is, uh, that that's the work, I think, if we really want to build um, meaningful change that really changes how we value culture and creativity and meaning making and and human connection in a different way that exists um, in a way that people can make a living and feed their families, but that doesn't uh, sort of define value only by its ability to return economically. Thank you, Laura. Um, so that is our time today. And I just want to thank um, Akeem, Laura, and Sunil um, for bringing their expertise to provide us such a rich portrait of community and ecosystems um, to understand how um, creators, small businesses, and all of us are connected together. So um, I want to thank everybody for attending today. And I hope that um, coming away from this presentation, if you are a creative small business or um, a creator that you have uh, feel that you have some more resources at hand and some more answers and support. And if you are a fan um, of, of creative arts, um, that you uh, feel inspired to turn to your community and to find your creators um, and to discover all the unique and wonderful ways that we express um, our inspiration and creativity. So thank you so much again, uh, everybody for joining us um, and happy World IP Day.